My name is Stella Gudger. I'm the executive director of the Price Public Community Center in Swift Museum. It's located in Rogersville, Tennessee. Dr. Franklin was actually one of the first black graduates of Maryville College. He graduated in 1880. After graduation, he then went to uh, the Lane Seminary out of Cincinnati, Ohio. When he graduated from um, uh, the seminary, Miraville College actually sent him to Rogersville to preach, teach, and establish a school. And I always thought that was such a big order, you know, of business to be able to, to do all of that. Um, but when he first came, of course, there was no school, and he had to teach out of an open frame building with newspapers on the wall. I think back on this, and I'm thinking what a, you know, what a horrible situation to be in. He moved his uh, classroom to St. Mark's Presbyterian Church, which at that time was located on McKinney Avenue in Rogersville. He taught there for probably about 10 years before uh, the Presbyterian Churches of the United States actually built Swift College. That was built in 1893. So from that point on, uh, there, there were struggles and but uh, it was the beginning of the Swift Memorial College, okay? Uh, when he taught, when he first came and he taught out of this open frame building with newspapers on the wall and no underpinning, uh, I don't know how many students he had at that time, but I do know that from that point he did move to uh, the St. Mark's Presbyterian Church, which was located on uh, McKinney Avenue at that time. Uh, and I'm thinking that's, you know, for 10 years he taught there. That had to be such an asset to the city and to, uh, to Swift to be able to have, uh, you know, a building to do that. But of course, uh, we must remember that he was also the pastor of St. Mark's Presbyterian Church. So uh, I'm sure he felt right at home. And then we go from there. Uh, the college was built in 1893. Then St. Mark's, he no longer taught at St. Mark's, but St. Mark's was moved to the campus of the college. And from there, you know, that was a, a turning point too for the students because they had services, well actually, they had devotion every morning in the chapel. And then on Sundays, uh, they would go to church. Sunday morning, they would go to church and the women would be dressed in their, they had to wear hats and wear gloves and they had to march by twos uh, and they would go to church. And then in the afternoon, they would have, I think, uh, Vespers is, is what they called it then. And, uh, and then they were also, they had, uh, were allowed to have uh, a social date, <laughs> per se, and uh, for one hour. And uh, I always thought, you know, that was pretty strict. And the other things, they would like go downtown, they would have to have a chaperone. Because when you think about a high school, it was a four-year high school, the students would go right into college and so there was a lot of diversity there because we had students from the Northeast, the Southeast, and uh, also, you know, the local students. So it was, a, it was a big deal. I mean, I've had people often ask, well, how did you get such an elite college in this little rural town of Rogersville? And it was because of the Presbyterian Churches of the United States and Miracle College. What I understand for the daily lives of a student at SWIFT, uh, I'm, I'm sure for the college was so much different than for, you know, the local high school students who were a part of it. Because I know that it was very, very strict. Um, you know, the boys, the boys had a separate dormitory and, and the girls had a, you know, a separate dormitory. And so, 
And it was, when I say separate, I mean that it was actually in a different location uh, with the, uh, the dormitories. But like I said, they were able to uh, socialize with each other. And I think a big thing was the sports because we had basketball and football and, and tennis. And so that was one of the highlights, I think, uh, of the school. And I think people just had a, just a, a fun time, really. I know there were the academics and everything, but I think there was a real connection with how the students felt about the school. And uh, I know I, I really regret <laughs> that I was not, when I was in high school, that the college had already closed. So uh, I, I do re regret that. But uh, I think the normal life, you know, um, we had a cafeteria, um, just the, as normal schools would have. I mean, at this point, it was, I think the tuition was like $48 a year, uh, and I'm not sure. I don't even think the local students had to, uh, you know, they didn't have to pay any tuition at all. Um, it was, was just a fun time. Was there a work study component? There was a work study component. Uh, because they they had to work in the cafeteria, they had to help do laundry because they had a laundry room, and I suppose maybe with the with the the male students perhaps they had to uh, do other things. I think there was a plot of land where uh, there were vegetables that were grown and therefore they would go and pick the vegetables and then bring them back and, and peel the potatoes or whatever they, you know, cook the greens or whatever. And so that was part of the component. I, I know that and I know that they did have to do laundry and I think that helped pay for their tuition. I mean, being a local and not staying in the dorm, uh, I'm not sure what their regiment was. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what time they did get up, but they did do breakfast. And all of the students, when they assembled for classes, all of the stu students went to uh, the auditorium and we would have devotion. Uh, not like today. Uh, <laughs> you understand, they've taken a lot of things out of the school, so. But uh, we all had devotion. Then we would go to class and then there would be uh, the lunch period and back in class. And Swift, uh, uh, Swift did have an ensemble, uh, and I know that they traveled, and whatever they made from their concert, that money would be turned back in to the college. I sort of visualize that it may be similar to the Fish Jubilee Singers, how they would travel. Uh, and I know that they were very, very good because, uh, you know, they always done well. And uh, anytime there was a special event, they were, they were always on program. And so everybody just, you know, you could hear a pin drop because they were that good. Some of the buildings on campus that really stands out in my mind was uh, the Home Economics Building because <laughs> That's where we learned to, uh, you know, sew and cook. And the clothes that we made, we would always model those clothes when we had May Day. And everybody always looked forward to May Day, wrapping the, ma the maypole and just, you know, it's just a big event that we had every year. We would have, always have a baseball game and, uh, you know, the fashion show and wrapping of the maypole. So it was a big, it was a big deal. Uh, some of the other buildings, like I, I had said before, there were the dormitories for the, where the male students stayed and then the uh, female stayed within the, the administration building where the classrooms and all of, all of those other activities were. We also had a gymnasium that was not in the school. It was on the property of the, of the campus. So that was that was pretty neat. We also had like a baseball field, but we did not have a uh, football field. We actually used the uh, Rogersville City School 
football field. We would have it one night and then they would do it another night. I always thought that was pretty interesting, you know, because it was more like it was a, a community thing. There was some unity there. Uh, and I, I thought that was really good. Um, I think the other buildings that were on were uh, the president's home, and it was it was really a nice home. Uh, basically, I think that was it for all of the buildings. Well, the administrative building, uh, you know, it, it was large, three floors, hardwood floors. Um, I know I've heard some students say they were always afraid to go. There was another level they were always afraid to go up there because they thought there were ghosts there. And <laughs> I don't know, I never went up there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it was three floors and uh, it, it was so huge. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think about the number of students. At one time, there probably were maybe two, 200, maybe 250 students. Uh, in all, uh, but it, it was a very large building and, and it was very beautiful. The auditorium was actually beautiful, uh, as, as I remember. I, I just think it was a, a great building. Actually, starting from the, the very beginning of, of 18 and 83, when the college first began, uh, it actually did very well. Uh, until, I guess it was maybe in, I don't know, the early 50s, that by this time the Presbyterian churches had about 22 colleges, and they felt like they could no longer fund that many colleges. So they actually appointed a board, an, an advisory board here in Rogersville to try to keep it uh, running. And also who was involved in that was the... Uh, the Board of Missions of, for Freed Men, so they were part of it too, and they tried so hard to keep it going, but it just didn't work out. So in 1955, uh, Swift closed. The building was actually sold to the Hawkins County Board of Education for $100,000. And then at that time, even though it closed in 1955, it remained as a high school, and then Actually, they sent all of the students uh, from Price Public Elementary School in 1958 to Swift High School. And then Swift High School uh, became first grade through 12th grade. And then uh, integration came in 63. And then in 64, the next year, uh, they actually tore the building down. Well, I, let me say this. Actually, 63 was the last year uh, of the Swift uh, High School, and then integration actually started in 1964, and then that was the same year they tore the building down. The impact of tearing uh, the administrative building down was a huge, <laughs> I'm not even sure what word to use, but it was a, let me just say, it was a huge disappointment to the blacks of the community. Uh, first of all, uh, we had no say about it. It was, it was, a decision was made and it was done. And I understand that they took truck loads of things from the school to the city dump. And so there was a lot of history, a lot of artifacts that were lost. I think I could use the word devastating. It really was devastating because, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. And all you have are, are pictures and memories. And that's, that's one of the reasons we, you know, established the museum. Even though it's just a one-room museum, it, it's, it's got a lot of history here that people can come. And, you know, it's preserved. It's not lost. And I think that's the main thing. Uh, when, once you lose history, you've, you just can't get it back. That there were really some trailblazers, you know, with, with the college. And I think that Dr. Franklin was certainly one of those trailblazers because the conditions and the struggles that he, he went through. 
but he was very intelligent, he was very well educated, he was very articulate. I think Dr. Franklin had a vision for Swift. Uh, having been educated uh, through uh, Maryville College, I think he, he had this vision of how he wanted the students to be. He did not want them to just be a, a student that got an education and probably could do domestic work and get a job because we have to remember there were no jobs, there were no schools after the Civil War. Well, there were a few schools in the South, but there weren't a lot of schools. So I think he had this vision. He wanted students to be an all-around person. He had, uh, so like Swift had the arts, they had music, they had sports, they had religion. I think he wanted the student to be an all-around uh, student. And I, I just, I think he wanted to have a value, let the students know that it was important to have a value education. He also wanted them to know to have life values. I think that was important to him so that they would be able to go out and be productive and also be able to enjoy uh, life itself. So. I think had it not been for his vision that probably, you know, Swift would not have produced um, lawyers and doctors and nurses and teachers and all of these professional people would not have happened had he not had this vision. So I really think that's the legacy of, uh, of Dr. Franklin. Dr. Franklin's uh, last year at Swift was, I think, 1926. And then when he, he died, it was just a big blow to the whole city because he had established so much in Rogersville. And so when he died, all of the businesses closed down for that day when he had his funeral. And to me, that that just showed a lot of respect that they had for Swift and for Dr. Franklin. You know, all of these, the book of the history of Swift, I, I would hope would not be forgotten. I, I, I would love to see this passed down from one generation to the next generation to the next generation, uh, you know, to tell, you know, the children how it really was. And I, I think, you know, our, our plans are to have the fifth grade tours, which will uh, let those fifth graders who are now studying uh, American history, will let them know their history in their own city, the culture of the African Americans in their city, uh, and just you know, it's such an important part to know your history. And so I, I just think, you know, it was a great, he was a great asset to Rogersville. I think, well, let me just say that I think Rogersville was just a unique town in its own because uh, there were black businesses downtown. Um, there was, I know there was a black uh, barber shop and there was a, a restaurant called uh, Arch Fane's uh, Restaurant. Um, and I think people really actually had respect for each other. I think that, uh, and I attribute a lot of that to the college uh, because people that are, are educated, I, I think there's, there's that respect. I, I remember, um, you know, when they, uh, when they did integrate, from what I was told, that there was not, uh, you know, incidents, major incidents. I'm sure there were some, but not major incidents. And so I think that's because 
the people in Rogersville actually just respected each other. Uh, now, I'm not so naive that I would not believe <laughs> that there's, were, you know, prejudice, uh, and I'm not saying that, but I am saying that there was a respect, and I think when people respect each other, I, I think that's so important, you know, because that means that, you know, it's okay to have your opinion about different things, so. Uh, it was, uh, like I said, I think there was a lot of unity and, uh, you know, in the community because I know that uh, we had whites and blacks that actually played uh, basketball on our courts. I mean, that was just a routine daily thing that they played together. It seems kind of odd now that I think about it. They would play together, but then you know, they would go to school, they would go to different schools, but yet they had that connection with each other. And I, I just think that was, that's important. In 1901, it's when the doors, the legislat legislature closed the doors to blacks. And, and of course, Dr. Franklin had already been, he had already graduated. But Maryville College felt like it was very important that they give an endowment, part of their endowment, to Swift College. And as I remember reading, they took that uh, endowment, which was $25,000, and they actually built the boys' uh, dormitory. That's actually what was done with the money. And, uh, but I, I always think back about how Maryville College was such a big part of the success of Swift College. Uh, at one point, it was actually a four-year college, and then it was re-evaluated by the state of Tennessee, and then it only be, it became a junior college. It became a, and then the name was changed to a Swift Memorial Junior College. But Dr. Franklin here again was such a great educator and he had such great training that he, you know, he did a wonderful job and, you know, he de deserves all the credit. Some of the courses that I, that they had at SWIFT, uh, and I, I may be repeating myself here, but Dr. Franklin did want to make sure that the students were well-rounded, so I know that there was, uh, uh, of course, the sciences, uh, mathematics. Uh, they had, uh, you know, chemistry. They had uh, auto mechanics. They had uh, woodworking, and like I said, they also had the home economics where they they learn learn things. And of course, they had English, just a standard, uh, I guess, necessary criteria that they had to have in order to be, uh, you know, state funded. But um, sociology, and of course they had religion, they had religion classes. So, of course that was, you know, that set it apart simply because it was a Presbyterian liberal arts college. And uh, so that's kind of uh, the classes and things that they had. I don't remember that they had brick masonry. I don't. I don't think so. I, I've not read that. They did. I don't think they had. I never heard anybody mention that. I don't think so.